We've been fighting a long time, and we have all lost so very much. So many loved ones gone. But you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. You have no idea how important you are. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. Ave Maricela. Everybody, whenever, wherever you are, Steve Cunningham with Sense of Adele. I'm coming at you with somebody you may have heard once or twice in your lifetimes. Father Ripker, how are you doing today? Doing pretty good. Thanks for having me, Steve. Thanks for coming on. We're doing this because of a launching of a new and improved website or the press company that Father runs. Father, tell us That's a little right. bit about it. Okay, so for the longest time, I just basically had uh, the distribution with the except of, exception of hardback books were always just done through Amazon because I just didn't have time for distribution. But now I actually found someone who can actually do the distribution. So we launched a new website. It's just called Centrad, S-E-N-T-R-A-D, press, dot, uh, com, I think, or org. Uh, I'll have to check that. But uh, but anyway, dot so... Com. Dot com. There we go. So, um, and... This way, the distribution if people, especially for people who don't like Amazon, uh, myself being actually one of them, uh, we can uh, uh, because it, I think it's just too bit of a. It's one. Of, it fulfills one of those observations about um, when capitalism is unimpeded, they tend to crush the capitalists. Tend to crush the uh, their their competition, which is what they basically have been doing. Uh, by undercutting them on sales. But the other thing that they do is then they become big promoters of socialism because of the fact that they're in control of the, the politicians so, so that they make sure they can segment out a little place for themselves, but nobody else type of thing, so they make more money. Okay, so that all being said. Um, not that I wanted to go on to a diatribe about Amazon, but... <laughs> uh, but anyway, so but we so we set up a, um, a distribution. So now the distribution can actually be done independent of that. You can use your normal credit card, that type of thing, to buy the books. Um, there will also be books on there that will not be available anywhere else. So, for example, the hardback book of my book on psychology, uh, which we can I'll show it to you here in just a little bit, is only available through this distribution. Um, it used to be on my website and you had to contact uh, the webmaster to try and find out. We've bypassed all that. It goes just regular. Uh, you can put it in your cart and all that. Um, we also are going to have some hardback books coming out, um, which will also be available on Amazon um, for the ones that are already currently out. And then the next thing we have coming out after that, which will probably be about March timeframe, is there will be a faux leather, it's a, you know, one of the fake leather ones, but they, they turn out pretty good, uh, version of the um, deliverance prayers for the laity, and it'll also be Smith's own, so it'll be hold up a little bit better because people have been hoping for something like that. That will be available only through our distribution. Um, and then um, there is a book that I'm gonna be putting out um, called The Nature and Psychology of Diabolic Influence. It's meant only for clergy or um, who are becoming exorcists or clergy who want to read about it. So instead, because there's a enormous amount in there on the practical side for exorcists on how to, actually it's basically a manual that exorcists can consult to figure out, you know, how do they proceed, et cetera. But then, uh, and it's also meant for um, healthcare professionals uh, and the like who uh, are working in this area. Um, then I'm gonna do a cut down version of that for the lay people, um, which will be about 500 pages um <laughs> you, you <laughs> it's only yeah it's only going to be 500 pages but it it will it will give people a thorough understanding it's not going to be an easy read but it'll give people a thorough understanding of of a couple of things it's the title on it is just called dominion um uh but uh and it's i think the subtitle is the nature of spiritual warfare but in there it's um it's it will actually help the lay people to get a better understanding of demons how they function how they work psychologically etc also how they affect us psychologically to some degree so that they can have a sense of uh, how to through that 
Um, the one, the one for the lady will be also available on Amazon. It'll be available on our website. But um, the one for the priest will be available um, only on our website. So the, the distribution, we're going to start limiting the distribution in relationship to Amazon um, and other companies uh, in order to bolster the distribution on this website. Yeah, it goes back to the think locally, act locally, uh, ladies and gentlemen, about uh, helping somebody like Father yeah. that because you give a tremendous cut to Amazon, they lowball you and then they sell it at the a rate that you basically get like maybe pennies if you get sales from Amazon versus if you buy directly from the site, it helps you way more than it does from Amazon. Yeah, you, I mean you can you you determine what uh, how much you want to collect on the royalties per book. The problem is is that with their cut. Um, you know, if you want to make the book uh, easily available to people, you don't want books to be too expensive, or if you want to make them, you know, be competitive in a particular area. Not that I'm not that the stuff I do is competitive because it's kind of sui generis, most of it. But um, they, you, you have to keep the price down in order to make it because because people aren't going to pay you, you know, forty dollars for a small hardback or a small or not hardback but a small paperback. So you have to you do have to. Um, kind of take a cut in relationship to this. So this will kind of eliminate them out of the process. So let's get to why should people read in general? And then we'll get into some of the books you have on the website. But you did a series long ago in a spiritual life, and one of them was reading, uh, spiritual reading in general. But why should people read books anyways? Uh, I think there's several reasons. Um, one is... Uh, we do not live in a time where people can be ignorant of their faith. I've, you've, people have heard me say that before. You can't be media. You can't have mediocrity. The second component to that same thing is, is that also means that you're going to have to read and uh, to the degree you're based on your state in life. You're going to have to read books in order to come to knowledge of everything that you need to know in relationship to faith. To not necessary to defend it or to do any kind of public speaking like I do or you do, but but in order so that um, you can keep your course in the in the things that are being said in the church and this and that, because we see this all the time. You see this actually, the um, people will, you'll see this on the um, uh, on the comment sections under our YouTube things, you know, people are making statements which are like, this guy's obviously never read this, 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 or this, right? And But they're making these statements as if it's they're authoritative, so it, it can cut down on your humiliation and actually knowing this stuff. Um, but I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that um, you can listen to stuff, but that doesn't, and that helps, uh, especially for people who are kind of starting out and need to kind of know where to kind of go with certain things, um, or they just kind of want to get a rounded, get a rounded understanding in a particular area. But if you're really going to actually understand things well, you actually have to have intellectual habits, and intellectual habits are um, like any other habit. You have to make those intellectual judgments over and over and over again in relationship to a specific thing, and then as you do that, your judgment becomes much more precise. Well, that's what a book does. That's what reading does. It helps you to address a topic in a more thorough fashion so that your intellectual habits are more honed so that you're less likely to fall into error. And I, and many of you have heard me also say that the real problem today is lack of precision. And so this is one of the things that you'll see is it's, um, you know, you can see this coming out in magisterial documents. They'll make statements. I'm like, well, how does that jive with what Pius the Ninth said or with which you know Louis XIII said, uh, or this or that, and and the reason being is is because they don't read this stuff anymore. People even writing some of the church documents don't read this stuff anymore, um, and so this is one of the reasons why we're seeing it. And so, in order to have that knowledge, so that you don't get led astray, is by actually um, is by actually doing some reading. Now, there is a thing called census fidelium, ironically, in which people who have a grace will have a sense when something is off or when it's not, but that itself needs to be trained through reading and more precision so that as you go along you're relying less and you don't presume on god's giving you that grace you need to make sure that you're doing your part in order to to learn from these types of things it also provides you with information that you're not going to get on um uh on a podcast even though i do them you're not going to get uh, a rounded a, a more rounded understanding of something or at the same depth that you would um, just by listening to a podcast, even if the person's talking about it or doing a systematic presentation, you're still not going to get that same depth that you're going to get in relationship to uh, uh, reading a book that has 
the depth that's already there. What kind of books on your site? Now you got it's all over the place for laity to uh, clerics, and uh, like when uh, something happens with tradition, you you and I will text each other, and you'll say if they just read this book. And it's the, I think it's the, the black book on uh, Return to Tradition. Not Return to Tradition, that's uh, Anthony's channel. But uh, topics on tradition, <laughs> they would be, and they'd be okay on figuring out what's going on and not, not losing their minds, but kind of like uh, getting anxious about what's going on. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that exactly, so one of the things I've been trying to do in some of the writing that I've done, not all of it, because some of it is just very niche stuff, like the stuff on psychology and the stuff on diabolic influences, written for a very specific thing. And <clears throat> part of it is trying to address a pastoral situation, but a lot of it is just uh, to provide the, a coherent systematic presentation. Um, for example, my book on psychology, um, which I'll show here in just a minute, but that's the one that, you know, it's, it's, it's primary goal is to give people a coherent, Thomistic, um, Catholic anthropological approach to mental health. Um, and then the book on the psych, um, on the diabolic is to give exorcists or guys who are training to be exorcists a systematic approach in knowing the actual material. So, um, and this is uh, this is something in which what I've always tried to do is probably, there's some that do that, but that what I've always tried to do is provide people with when I start to see an intellectual problem cropping up, which is basically I learned from St. Thomas, because that's what St. Thomas would do. If there was a particular issue or area, he would start writing on that or start addressing that in his writings um, in order to address it. So it's kind of a, pa ironically, to use a Vatican II phrase, it's a pastoral approach to writing, right? So um, it's basically addressing issues that are um, out there today. So, and that, so that's actually why I did it. So if you, I, I think the, the book that you're actually referencing here, let me just get that one here, is actually The Binding Force of Tradition. Yes. It's, there's actually kind of, it's a quasi trilogy that I wrote in relationship to this. The first is The Binding Force of Tradition. So I just talk about how, you know, uh, tradition binds us in the form of conscience. It's not just a matter of, of yeah, I kind of prefer it. I kind of like the tradition. I kind of like how they express, no we are bound under certain aspects to the forms of expression, how the Vatican has delineated things, their definitions, um, other aspects of the tradition. So I go into that and talk about how it actually binds in the form of conscience. And then the different degrees in which various statements made by the magisterium binds, to what degree do they bind morally? Because I think that's an issue that's uh, quite important. And then that dovetails with this book, which is called Magisterial Authority, which also deals with that, but it also deals with um, things like ordinary magisterial infallibility, but also what do you do, um, and that's what these two books actually address, what do you do if the Pope starts making statements that are just completely, you know, are contrary to what the church teaches? Well, there's an actual answer for that, and it's in the tradition. If you go back and look at it, the theologians already knew that this was going to be a problem or that it had been a problem even historically. That certain popes were saying certain things at certain times that they're like, you know, head scratching, like, okay, we got to address this. And so then that's when the uh, even Vatican I actually dealt with, okay, what are you, what are you going to do if the Pope speaks outside this context in which he is, we know that he's infallible? How are those issues to be, how are those statements to be addressed? And then the last one is, um, which is also deals with that area of infallibility, which is the consensus of the fathers and theologians. This is, uh, this is kind of a book that it's kind of created a little bit of stir among the unknowing. Uh, one, uh, I'm not going to mention his name because I don't want to give him too much attention, <laughs> but he basically just said the theologians aren't infallible, thinking I was talking about the modern theologians. And then when you're talking about, no, the church itself has always said, um, and the popes have even said that if the theologians, that is those from 1100, roughly 1100 to 1750, are unanimous that something is of the faith, then it's de fide. You have to, you have to give assent to it. Well, there's a lot of statements that are like that. And, and so the, this, this trilogy is actually designed to give a person an understanding of the tradition, how it binds, what statements of the Pope's bind, what statements of the various magisterial um, authorities bind, etc. So that's the idea kind of behind those. So that was one of those that I really wrote from a pastor point of view of like, you know, people need to know that it's not just a preference. It's actually we're bound to this stuff. And they're short reads, so I mean, we could get through that in uh, maybe an hour if you just sit down and just read the whole thing from cover to cover. Yeah, most of them. I think that's actually true. Um, 
There is another one that I did on um, tradition, which is the topics on tradition. This is just, this is actually a compilation of articles that I actually wrote over the course of time um, through Latin Mass Magazine and a few that uh, didn't get published, they were just kind of online. So I put those all in in one book so that people can actually read it, because this will give a better understanding of the tradition. I think one of the, I mean, people, People say, you know, Father, why are you so critical of the traditionalists? And but the reason I'm kind of critical of traditionalists is kind of like the way the parent kind of tells the child, don't do that, right? It's because of the fact that you love the you love the tradition, you love the traditionalists, you just want them to make sure that they that they understand they're doing the right thing, that they understand the right things, so that they don't end up saying things that make them an easy target or an easy straw man to you know just to blow away, so to speak, by some a neoconservative who doesn't even know what the church teaches in the tradition. And so that's one of the reasons why they, they need to know that. So um, there needs to be some depth in relationship to uh, their understanding of the tradition. They need to actually understand the tradition, which actually brings up the next book, which is Franzeline's uh, On Divine Tradition. So uh, I commissioned Ryan Grant to translate his text, um, uh, De Tradizione, which he actually wrote. I, I, this book, the reason I had Ryan translate this book, so this is available on our press, on my press site. Um, on Ryan's press site, for a limited time, there's going to be a hardback available, and then it's going to become available in a few months on my website. Um, it's a hardback version of that. Uh, when I would read people like Kangar or, um, you know, various writers in the area of tradition, who were modernists, right? And I would read this stuff, I'm like, ah, this stuff just really annoys me because I knew, having read enough about the tradition in some of the manuals, that they were just off, right? Well, they kept referring to this book by Franz Lehmann. I'm like, you know, this, and, and, and even though they disagreed with him and they denied what he would say, there was always this nod to him, like, okay. So I'm like, okay, obviously this text is key. So I started looking for it, couldn't find it, about a year later, I managed to find it in Germany, paid a boatload of money for it. In fact, it's kind of funny because Ryan ended up getting his copy for like $20, and I paid $135 for mine. Uh, but anyway, so um, when I started reading it, of course, it's all in Latin. I'm like, I understand now why this is the standard for any discussion on tradition. This guy outlines the whole thing. Um, Bellerman has a lot of stuff on tradition, but it's not a systematic laying out of the structure of tradition like uh, Franzlin did. So it became the standard, even among the modernists. They realized, look, if you're going to address this and you're going to be a true scholar, you've got to at least give your nod that you've actually read this guy. Because if you haven't, then you're not even in the area of scholarship in this area. So I had Ryan translated into English. We're hoping to uh, put out a second edition where there's a little bit of re-editing done, but it's uh, currently available. This one, if the if the um, if if a traditionalist can make his way through this book, his knowledge of tradition is going to be uh, much better than most traditionalists. Oh yeah, that's the most underrated book out. There. That's nobody has read that thing, and everyone needs that in their library. Yes, exactly. In fact, uh, um, one time I was talking to Scott Hahn of all people about the book, and he read it. And uh, so he was asking somebody about the translation and the person said, yeah, the translation is good. It needs a little bit of editing, which is what I told uh, um, Scott Hahn that yeah, it needs a little bit of editing, but otherwise it's up to snuff. But, um, but I think it's one of those that even of the people that did not, that are um, much like me, because Scott Hahn was a lot like me in the sense that you'd read all these other people, but it, you hadn't read The Master. I mean, this is the book, uh -huh. the book on tradition. Um, and most people aren't going to be able to read it in Latin, so I just said we got to get this into English. Um, and unfortunately, like you said, <laughs> nobody's buying this thing, which is uh, which is sad, right? Because you would think that this would be the book that everybody would actually want to be able to um, to buy soon. Yeah, when I read it, I could put. I remember one time, and this is not a knock on Tim Staples. They uh, he did a four uh, four DVD or CD set on uh, basically the end times and fr uh, fr in divine on divine tradition has it in one paragraph his entire cd set in the most concise and easy to understand form that i've i was like i didn't need that cd set anymore it's like you could just get this book and you have it done right yeah 
Yeah, and he goes into facets about tradition that people are just completely unaware of. It was very revelatory to me to actually understand the the that it gave a depth to my to my understanding of the tradition that I just didn't have, even though I had read as much as I could get my hands on the topic. So, what um, what's next? Okay, so the next one is the Lincoln and Omaha servings. These sermons, these were the these were the sermons that I did um, when I uh, was first ordained. And um, I just kind of put them, collated them into a book because at that time I was still writing out some of them and I was still doing, uh, having notes. So I just filled them out. Um, and now I rarely, if I might have some, a couple of notes just to keep myself on track, but now I don't do that, which is why they all end up on, <laughs> on your channel. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but this is, um, so this is, that's actually one of the things that I actually did is the put those all together so people can read. That's an actual easier read for most lay people because sometimes lay people complain about some of my books saying that they're extraordinarily difficult to get through, um, which I understand. Part of it is, uh, um, you know, we have to accept the fact, and we're seeing this right now, that the intelligentsia, it's a delayed reaction. It takes somewhere between 20 and 50 years, but what the intelligentsia teach and promote becomes what the general culture ends up imbibing because the people learning under them become the teachers of the people in the culture. And so you end up with this scenario with um, uh, that what the intelligentsia are promoting actually ends up becoming um, what the culture or determines what the culture becomes. And so that's when I started realizing I have to put these at at least at a high enough level so that even the scholars are not going to scoff at it and say, yo, well, he didn't address this or that. So that's why a lot of times it becomes somewhat complicated. It's also why my book on diabolic influence is 828 pages. <laughs> and the reason being is because of the fact that I had to address literally all these wacky ideas that are out there, where they came from, why they're not accurate, why we know they're not true based upon the tradition of the church. So, so and then this is the hardback of the book on psychology. Um, I think it's 817 pages, so it's a little shorter than my other one. So people can uh, read this. It's not that's not an easy read. Um, that it's in hardback, um, which is again available on our site, and then there's also the softback, uh, which has a new cover. It's a slightly different cover than this one. Um, I gave so away a couple of those during my Uber days. Yeah. <laughs> no, so I had yeah, some psychologists are, uh... in the car, and I, I would they would tell me who they are. I go, eh, I got I got a book you like, and. Just here, check this out. See if you like this. <laughs> you know, sometimes people say to me, Father, you're not impressed by much. And I said, no, I'm not really. I mean, uh, but uh, but if somebody manages to get through that book, I'll have a certain degree of being impressed with them. <laughs> so, but uh, another book which I kind of wrote, uh, again, as a pastoral kind of a thing, is uh, the, uh, the Principle of the Integral Good, because this is something that I started noticing that um, people just started thinking that it was okay to do certain things as long as you had good intentions, you know. Even though what you're doing is actually sinful, they thought it was okay because, well, you were well-intended. Well, no, that's not how this works, right? And so that was one of the reasons I wrote the book. The other thing, the reason I wrote it, and I'm not going to do a spoiler here, so you're going to have to buy the book if you actually want to understand what the rationale is. But I actually wanted to address the resurgence of what they call the branch theory in ecclesiology, which basically said that these other religions are actually part of the church that Christ founded. And so I wanted to show, no, that's contrary to the principle of the integral good, and it's contrary to the principle of exclusive, uh, the excluded middle. But if you want to see why that is, it's in this book, which is why the Catholic Church is the only church that fulfills the principle of the integral good, and I go into that in there. I also address about uh, in a, a bit more depth about movies because sometimes people will watch my video on movies and stuff. So I go into it in there a little bit more in depth. So that's actually one of those books that uh, I'm kind of surprised. It's actually I thought it would get a lot more blowback than it did, and it has gotten some. Um, but it's uh, it's actually been had a better impact than um, than I, or a, a more positive impact than I thought it was going to have even among some of the neoconservatives, and which was kind of surprising because a lot of them buy kind of these new ecclesiological theories and things of that sort. Um, but it's, uh, that, and so I was kind of mildly surprised that it actually did better with them than I thought. Um, here's another one for exorcists. It's just called the Manual, uh, Manuale Exorcorum. 
it's, it's actually just a reprint of a book that was available in the 1600s on um, the uh, the on exorcism and things of that sort. The book that I put out for clergy, which I'll mention here in a minute, or we'll talk about why it's only for clergy, Minor Exorcisms and Deliverance Prayers, a bulk of this book, that is the Minor Exorcisms, um, came from this particular book because we basically were able to, uh, Ryan uh, Grant was able to transcribe it. So we have a lot in English in here in, in this book of the, the rituals, but this also includes other things that are, aren't in my book. Um, uh, and so it's really kind of meant for scholars, uh, which is why I've sold uh, so few of them. Um, but this but this book, The Minor Exorcisms and Deliverance Prayers, some lay people are buying them and they're reading out of this. I'm like, no, 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 this is only for clergy. You can, Only the priests are permitted to use this. Now, some of the prayers in the first part and some of the prayers at the end are also in the deliverance prayers for the lady, and they can use those. But this is meant only for actual for clergy. I wanted to put a book together because priests were saying, you know, I need more tools when I don't have faculties yet to do solemn exorcism. I need more tools that I can use in order to get the demons to the surface. And so that's what I, that's why we put this book together. This also has the exorcism of a house, which I found to be the most, um, even though you can use um, Chapter 3 of Title 12 of the 1962 Ritual of Romanum for that. I found that this one is much more efficacious, to, um, which comes from the milk line uh, ritual. And I find it's it, it, there's only been a couple of places. In fact, there's only two houses that I know of that I've had to go back and do exorcisms again after having done this one. Usually you do this, it's a one-shot huh. deal. So, but anyway, this is meant for clergy so that they, these, you can, they can use this, uh, all the prayers in here without having faculties for solemn exorcism. And even priests who uh, are not exorcists can use the book um, to help the faithful. Um, and this is also beneficial because the Vatican has recently come out, um, not recently, it was about 12 years ago, I think, um, observing that chapter three, which is the exorcism for apostate angels, is forbidden for the lay people to use. But it's also a priest has to have his permission from his bishop, which is a little different from getting faculties from solemn exorcism. He has to have permission to use that. Um, and so sometimes bishops are a little reluctant to give that, but priests can use the prayers out of here because they don't require any further permission. Maybe so the laity can book. buy that for their local priest or seminary for Christmas gifts or if someone gets ordained. Yeah, or they can buy it for study purposes, but they can't use them as prayers. Right. Um, but the one for the deliverance prayers for the laity, which is, um, I'm not even going to bother holding it up because everybody's seen that one. Um, that one is um, sold quite well. It was kind of a niche book. I realized there was nothing really kind of out there. But as I mentioned, we're coming out with a, um, a full leather version here in about three months. It's at the printers now. Um, uh, Pre-COVID, it, uh, it would be out at the beginning of the year. But post-COVID, we're looking at the February, March time frame. So, um, but, and it'll obviously be a bit more expensive because of the fact that it's actually full leather. But I'm right. trying to price it because I'm not going to be selling it to other retailers because one of the things that most people don't know is that when you're when you're running a press, pricing a book is a delicate thing because you don't want to make it too expensive, but you know that retailers are going to come back and want 40 or 50% off of your retail price so that they can make a profit off of it, right? Uh -huh. The problem with that is, is that um, that means that you actually have to price the book higher than you normally would um, because, you, because otherwise, um, if you tell them, well, I can only give you 30% off, then they get you know, little touchy about the fact that they're not going to make as much profit off of it. Well, this particular um, faux leather one, I'm not going to be giving to retailers. And the, the reason being is because if I did that, it'd have to be like $65 yeah. just to be able to get my, uh, the, to get our capital back out of this. Because once the capital, we get the capital out of that, it's going to be going to other books that we're going to be, um, to be printing. So we we're going to price it probably about $35, maybe a little bit more. But, um, but it'll last longer, so people won't have to buy it as frequently. But that one will be available, too. So, uh, and then uh, just a couple of other books before I go into uh, some more uh, some more of the prayer books. Uh, Morality of the Exterior Act, this is one of these things where I wrote my doctoral dissertation on how we know, I mean, if you were to encapsulize it or summarize it, it's how do we know what we're doing morally, right? So um, the example I often give is, you know, if you see a black man on the streets of New York taking a purse from a white woman, 
What is that morally? Well, most people immediately, because of prejudice and variety, not just prejudice, but other things, right? Just because of the way we, we, we think, we think it's theft, right? And I said, well, but you don't know that. You actually have to know the condition of the purse. How do you know that's not his purse mm -hmm. and she's not the thief, right? So you have to actually know what the actual, because today <laughs> you just never know. It could be his <laughs> purse, right? So, um, or it could be his wife's purse or what have you. So the point being is, is that um, you actually have to know the condition of the purse. So there was a, var I go into the, the nature of the moral act, how we actually understand the moral act. In fact, there was, I, I won't mention the priest because uh, I think it's a bit unfortunate what he wrote on the vaccinations. Um, but uh, that he ended up criticizing me. And at one point he says, it makes me even wonder if Father River even knows what the object of the moral act is. Well, I actually wrote my dissertation on that subject. <laughs> so it's one of those kinds of uh, things. But it's the, the, the interesting thing about that book is um, the places that it tends to be, uh, it's selling the most is in places like Brazil and in Spanish speaking countries. And the reason being is, is because some of the um, academics in those areas are looking for a foundation for, um, you know, how do we start assessing things on a moral level? Like, how can you assess whether the vaccination is moral or not? How can you assess these things? And so this book actually lays out all the principles for the fonts and what we, how you can um, parse out the various moral act, various parts of the moral act, and then from that actually know what you're doing morally. And so this is that's one of the reasons. But I wrote my dissertation on that. I figured oh, I'll just put it out as a book and see how it goes. It sold a little bit. Sometimes people are reading it. Uh, but like I said, it seems to be selling more um, south of here, huh. ironically. So uh, and then there's a few other books that I have, which uh, I did not write, but which uh, I decided to put out. One is just called Lucifer. It's the true story of the famous diabolic uh, position in Alsace. It's actually interesting. It gives you a sense of how demons kind of function psychologically and how they behave and how they talk, um, how they sometimes act like little kids, right? <laughs> so this gives you a, a sense of that. It's uh, also, there's some things in there I want to just out so that I could point to exorcists when I was training them, that if you go look in here, you'll see this particular uh, characteristic that demons behave. You'll see it in that book uh, in its, uh, in its train and, and how they do it. The next one is also a study book. It's called prayers to expel evil spirits. Lay people can um, re, uh, buy this as a form of study um, and priests can use it as a form of study, but it, I, I'm, I'm tempted to actually take this off the market because people are thinking that they can actually use this as a prayer book when it's actually not. This is actual the uh, prayer against apostate angels of Leo XIII, but it's translated into English. And it was a translation that was fairly common and it was out there. So I put it out initially for exorcists to be able to use as a form of study, but I think people are buying it for to pray themselves and they really shouldn't be because, the, as I said, the Vatican in 1985 said that lay people were forbidden its use entirely. So um, that that is it's basically the longer form of the St. Michael prayer is what they sometimes it's referred to. So, and then I just have two other books. Um, one is Auxilium Christianorum, which everybody seems to know a little bit about. We still we put those out. Uh, the Auxilium Christianorum, you don't have to buy this from us. There's other companies that are also putting out the little booklets as well um, because of the fact that um, the Auxilium Christianorum is considered public domain uh, at this point, even though it's ecclesiastically approved and there is a copyright on it. They let anybody print it or reprint it or post it um, primarily to promote the devotion. Um, the reason they had to get the copyright is the same reason why the Vatican now copyrights its books, huh. which I'm not sure if you heard. No. But, okay, so in the past, the Vatican always considered its documentation to be the general patrimony of humanity. So they never copyrighted anything. Well, what, when Benedict went to um, change the translation of the Mass in uh, English, the uh, ICEL, International Committee for English on the Liturgy, came back and said, oh, no, you don't. That translation is copyrighted, and we own the copyright. Wow. So the Vatican had to, that's why the Vatican completely redid the translation of the new Mass, because of the fact that they didn't have control over the copyright, and then they copyrighted it. Well, now, because of that, because it got burned that way, they copyright 
everything they put out, which is very unfortunate. I mean, I don't care if they want to copyright, but they should do what I do in relationship to the actor and Christian Norm or other people do in relationship to the actor and Christian Norm. That it's just, you know, it's the patrimony of the church. Anybody can print it. You know, even then the reason you keep it is to keep yourself covered legally, which is unfortunate that we have to do that. And then the last one is a uh, holy hour of reparation to the Sacred Heart of Jesus for the neglect of negligence in priestly religious vocations. This was actually the, this is based upon the, uh, the traditional holy hour of devotion to the Sacred Heart um, that you would do in front of the Blessed Sacrament. It's just, there's been a couple of prayers that have been added, and those prayers are for the sake of the people who neglect uh, religious vocations. Um, the reason we put that out is because we realized the necessity that people need to do it. So I had a case of possession. Um, I'm not going to say which demon it was, but his shtick was that he would get some prospective seminarians to delay their vocations or defer their vocations by becoming worldly. And so they would get concerned about this or that in the world that said, right, you know, like, oh, I need to make money or I need to pay this off or I need to get this. I need to do that. Or, you know, or they or, or just become interested in marriage when their real vocation was to the priesthood. So he would drive that in them to get them to neglect their vocations or neglecting entering into the seminary or religious life. And then he also would once they became priests, he would get them bogged down in worldly affairs. Um, so that they would neglect their vocation and their duties of state in life. And so this is actually done in order to um, to uh, counteract the, um, the um, to make reparation for those who are neglecting their vocations, but also to counteract it so that those who do have vocations will actually enter the seminary. So that's kind of a, a short bio, uh, synopsis of what we have. As I mentioned, we have a couple of we have four more hardbacks coming out. They should be coming out in about two weeks. Um, there are books that we already have, but they'll be available in hardback. And then, as I mentioned, in March will be um, a day, a time in which we will get uh, quite a few um, or two more books out. There's also a third book, which I'll just mention. It's uh, my side of the text is done. We're still waiting on Ryan Grant, so I'm going to shame him now here <laughs> to finish his part. He only has like two pages left, but trying to get him to get those two pages done has been uh has been a bit of a monumental <laughs> task there. No, he's very busy because he runs his own press, of course. Yes, yes. Um, but uh, but basically, there was an author in the uh, 20s who wrote what became the definitive text on charismatic graces. It was included in, a, uh, um, in an encyclopedia, specific Catholic encyclopedia, but it became the normative text. It's about 50 pages long on what the charismatic graces are, how they function, etc. And this is long before, of course, even though he does actually address some of the things that we're seeing now in relationship to certain movements that um, claim they have the charismatic graces, etc. So what I did is I had Ryan transcribe the Latin in that because it's in that old Latin font. And then I told, and then he's doing the translation, which is almost done. And then the chapter that I did in the book on um, diabolic influence for the um, for the clergy, the lay version will not have that chapter because I don't want it to become the focus of because it's going it, to because this book is going to raise a few eyebrows. Um, and I didn't want it to become the focus. And so that's actually not in the lay book. It's only in the more technical manual for the clergy. And so I'm, I decided, though, I'm going to print it. In, so they'll have Hagen's stuff on charismatic graces and then mine in the same book. And that should come out probably about the March time frame as well. So this will address what the charismatic graces actually are, what their finalities are, what they're ordered towards, how the church always understood them up until uh, 1960, basically. Um, and where things kind of went awry in version. Also, um, what the authentic forms of the charismatic graces are, what the diabolic versions are, um, because they're, the demons can also mimic the charismatic graces. So this will be something that people might be interested, um, but that'll probably be about March, maybe April timeframe. We'll have to set the blowback account to see, uh, see if that increases the blowback uh, figures for us. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's... Um, yeah, but I, the, the thing is, the, the one thing I did do is I didn't, I, in this book, I did not, my goal wasn't to attack the people who claim they have charismatic graces, even though I personally do not think they do. My goal was to lay out, this is what they actually are. This is how we've always understood them. And so theologically, this is, 
this is what the approach we need to take because a Protestant approach was adopted. And so my goal wasn't to criticize the people who think they have them, but to just lay out the theology behind them. So just once again, ladies and gentlemen, centradpress.com. Go there for all your uh, Father Ripker books needs. Uh, the latest six, was it 800 pages you said? The most recent one? Yes. Eight, well, my, the one for the clergy is 828, and I think the one for the laity will be about 500. It will fill up that gap to your left there to get up to the two pile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. It'll, yeah, that's right. It'll perfectly fill that up, though. So check, yeah. so check it out. It's on the, it will be underneath in the show notes, uh, the link to that, maybe for your Christmas gifts or any day, not in Christmas gifts, gifts for priests, laity, friends, etc. The deliverance prayers will be a great one when it comes out in the faux labor. Uh, the fall, the uh, leather. I can't speak from English speaking people out there. Uh, <laughs> Father, any, any final words? I think that's it. Um, and I appreciate you letting me come on and trying to discuss, discuss a little bit about this. My real goal, as I mentioned in starting the press, was to get people to read. So I hope that this will help that. I appreciate your time and thanks for all the writings and all you do is well. And I'm sure everybody in the comment section will say the same thing. So, uh, Father, before you go, how about a final blessing like uh, usual? Oh, you bet. Benedicto de omnipotentis, patris et fili, et spiritus in supervos, et semper. Amen. Thank you, Padre. You're welcome.